Well, what a glorious day it is. I just want to uh, thank you for being here today just to come together to worship God during this feast. You know, God created this seven-day feast a long time ago, and he told us through the Apostle Paul to remember this feast, to realize that Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And then he says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, what is so cool about God is that he is the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. What God set out to do when he made mankind and he created us was a plan to bring us to salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And every facet of what God is doing through Jesus Christ was laid out in plan before any of it came to be. We celebrate the Passover of Jesus Christ looking back a couple thousand years. But that was proclaimed and celebrated well in advance of that happening. We celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread and we come together on this day when wave sheaf offerings were being made and where God told them, you've got to bring an offering and you have to do this or you don't get to partake of the harvest well before it ever happened, well before Jesus was ever brought to life and appeared to the Father in heaven. And they celebrated the Feast of Pentecost well before we can read about in the book of Acts that they received the Holy Spirit. All these things were laid out for our understanding. And God had a plan and a purpose when he dedicated the time to lay out for us his plan. What we do when we gather in these feast days is celebrating what he planned, what he planned from the beginning, and what he is working to accomplish. Now, these spring feasts focus us on his first coming. The fall feasts focus us on his second coming. But I want to look today at the first feast and specifically why we're here to celebrate, why we call this the wave sheaf day. If you will turn with me back to Leviticus chapter 23. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Leviticus chapter 23. So notice in verse 2 it says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, These are the feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts, says God. So these are the things that came from the mind of God, his plan, his design. Verse four, these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed time. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread of the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it but you shall make an offering. Now, I want you to drop down to verse 10 with me and notice this. So it says then, so speak to the children of Israel, when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest. Okay, so I want you to take your mind back now to the Israelites, what God is commanding them. He's taken them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He's brought them into a wilderness, and now he's telling them, I'm bringing you to this promised land. And when you do, and when you go in and begin to harvest the produce of that land, here's what I want you to do. So when you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma, and its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hen. And you shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. So here we have this instruction that God is giving. He's saying, you're gonna bring an offering. You're gonna bring it, and you're gonna bring it with a lamb that is, is a burnt offering, with a grain offering, and a wine offering. Now, you just ponder that for a little bit, and you think about what we've just been celebrating in the Lord's Supper. A lamb slain, a 
grain offering and a wine offering for a sweet aroma to God. And you think about that as we talk about what the meaning of all this is. But this day was a very important day because he said that if you didn't bring this offering, you couldn't start to partake of the harvest. Right? Look at there in verse 14. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. Now, if you had come into a land that God had given you, and God says, here's the harvest, and this is where you're going to get your food, how vital is it for you to make that offering? Would you say absolutely essential? How do you live without that offering? How can you have a life if you can't partake of the harvest that's before you? But God said, you can't have of it till you do this. And then, from this day, you're going to begin a count. A count of 50 days. So you're going to count from the morrow after the Sabbath, seven Sabbaths to be complete, to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. And that is the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost is a celebration of the end of the first harvest. But that celebration begins with today. It doesn't get to the day 50. You can't come to that day of celebration without this day. This is where day one begins. It's where the count begins. It's what starts there even to be a count. So, if you're taking notes, I've given you a lot of stuff right now, right? Put it down in your notes, and we'll talk about it as we go through. Now, what I want to do is I want to focus us just on a few things, on a few different points. When you begin to harvest, bring a sheaf of the first fruits, okay? So, that's the first point we want to discuss today. Second, you shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. Okay, so we're here on the day after the Sabbath Yesterday being the Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread, here we are. And then three, you shall partake of none of the harvest until the same day that you have made the offering. So we begin with a question, what is the harvest? What is the harvest? Now let's begin by looking at some of these verses. Turn with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23. Notice here in Exodus 23 and verse 14, it says, Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib, or of green ears. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of of your labors from the field, three times in a year all your males shall appear before the Lord God. So God was saying of all the feasts that he commanded, there are three times that are special where you are to appear before him. He doesn't mention here the Feast of Trumpets or the Day of Atonement. He mentions the three feasts, Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, or as it's called here, the Feast of Ingathering. Now turn over with me to Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16, and again, just keep looking at this from the eyes of God. Why was he writing this? Why is God breathing this for us? Deuteronomy chapter 16, and notice here now in verse 9. So you shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a freewill offering from your hand which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before the Lord uh, your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite, all who choose. In verse 12, you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. Verse 13, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you've gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, male servant, female servant, the Levite. So here God is giving these feasts, these three times, and basically what do we see? We see a timing to these feasts that is centered around the harvest. Now again, think of yourself as living in a society that is agrarian. 
This is how you have a living. You have a living because God is blessing your fields. When you plant, he's giving you produce. He's giving you a little piece of land. And what was so neat, when God was designing to bring his people into the promised land, he gave every family their own piece of land, their own lot. He gave them an inheritance that they could pass on from generation to generation. Now, it's interesting, in our society, we're very far away from this now. You know, 100 years ago, 90% of this country was agrarian. 10% were living in cities, and, and we've basically flopped that. We have about 10% now producing the food, and 90% not, living in cities and, and living in areas where they're not. So we've lost a connection with the land that God had said right from the very beginning when he made us, that you shall have the land, you shall keep it, you shall tend to it. And so there's some interesting things that are going on here. But if we look at these three times, we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and the Feast of Ingathering or Tabernacles. So here God has told us about these feasts, and we see that it's when the first harvest begins, right? Pentecost, the first harvest is complete, and the end of the year harvest, when you gather in all your produce and from your wine press and the grapes, and if you grow anything in your yard, you know that this is kind of the way it works. There's an early harvest of grain that comes up. There's some early uh, produce that you can take in from the fields, but then the greater harvest is that harvest at the end. Now, God designed this on purpose. He's the one who made the seasons. He's the one that made the signs. He's the one that set up these days as a remembrance of something that he was going to do from the beginning of his plan. Now, what is the harvest? Turn with me over to Luke chapter 3 and verse 17. Luke chapter 3 and in verse 17. Luke 3 and verse 17 says this, His winnowing fan is in his hand. This is John the Baptist speaking of Jesus. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. What was he talking about there? Was he talking about Jesus coming and actually having a field of wheat, and he was talking about physical wheat? What was he referring to? People. People gathering people into his barn, right? He says he will gather the wheat into his barn. Turn with me now over to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. This is the occasion when he was with the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. Notice what he says in John chapter 4 and in verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What work is God doing? Bringing many sons to glory. Verse 35, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They are already white for harvest. What harvest is he talking about? What was he telling his disciples in this message? That God is bringing forth people that are going to be his. He is making a distinction. He's making a separation between the wheat and the chaff. Notice now, and turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is a different time. When Jesus was with his disciples, the 70, he's getting ready to send them out. Notice what he says here in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. So he says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. God has a harvest that he's bringing forth. So Jesus said it to them at this point. Turn with me now over to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. This is at another time in Jesus' ministry. Matthew chapter 9. This was when he came and he saw the people and had compassion on them because they were a people without a shepherd. And so he says in verse 37, 
The harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out the labors into his harvest. And again, we can look over here in Matthew chapter 13. In explaining his parable, notice what he says. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 37. Matthew 13, 37. He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angel. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So what a beautiful thing, but a theme, a theme of Jesus in his parables, but it was a theme at different times when he had compassion on the people, he told his disciples. When he's sending out the 70, he tells his disciples. When there's the woman at the well, the Samaritan, the Gentile, he's telling his disciples. I wanted you to see the different time frames because this was a theme in what Jesus was teaching at different times in his ministry, trying to help his disciples to hear what he was saying, which is there's a harvest going on here. God is bringing forth a harvest. This has been his plan from the beginning of bringing sons to glory to raise them up to new life, to redeem his people and his children. And so he gave us these three feasts to commemorate the harvest and the seasons. Now, I want you to look back with me at Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. And we're going to answer this question because something very interesting goes on when we're talking about these harvest feasts, what God says he wants in these harvest feasts. Notice with me in Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. In verse 16, three times in a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. So here in these three feasts, God is saying, everyone is to appear before me, and none shall come before me empty. Everyone has something to give. Everyone comes to the Lord with something to offer him. Now, as much as we can look at the physical harvest and what they were bringing as they brought forth an offering, as they began their harvest in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then they had more to offer from at the gathering of the first harvest at Pentecost, and then that great harvest at the end, as much as we can look at it physically, I'm asking you to look spiritually at what God is doing. Because the harvest is not about wheat, growing in the earth that God is concerned with. He's concerned with you and me and the believers and bringing forth a harvest from this earth of what he is bringing forth in his children. And so when they come forth, he said, they shall appear before me and none shall appear before me empty-handed. They shall give as they are able according to the blessing of the Lord. Now notice this. This is some text that is from Hebrew. And in the Bible... It, there is the scripture, but then you see all the little writing on the sides and below? The main text is in those three middle columns, but between the columns and on the sides, the people that actually hand transcribed the word, Ezra was one of these scribes, but the Sophrim, would they would make notes along the way. As they would translate, they would make little notes because it was like accounting. We don't want to lose what the original was. So sometimes changes were made. Sometimes they said, we're gonna make a little change because we don't understand that this could be right, so we're gonna make a little change. And they actually did that, little subtle changes throughout the scripture. So one of the things that Bollinger points out in his companion Bible is that this phrase appeared before me. If you look literally at it and what the Sophrim made note of is that they softened the phrase because the phrase actually meant, see my face. Three times in a year you shall see my face, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Now, that's an interesting little 
change. Why do you think they might have made that change? Well, there's a verse in Exodus chapter 33 where God says, no man shall see me and live. No man shall see me and live. Now, as Christians today, is that true? How do we gain our life? How does Jesus say we gain our life as disciples? Is it not by losing it? Is it not by giving it up? He says, he who will gain his life should lose it. He who loses his life for my sake shall find it. He who seeks to save his life shall lose it. Excuse me. But he who lays down his life shall gain it. No man shall see God and live. We approach by our own death. The death in Christ allows us to come near to God. Now, this phrase appears in these verses. You can look them all up. We're not going to take the time to do that today. But it was in these places where the Sophrim said, we softened this phrase from see my face to appear before me. Now, why is this significant? Let's turn over to Psalm chapter 42. We're going to look at one of the places. Psalm chapter 42 Psalm chapter 42, just a very beautiful psalm of David. Notice what David contemplates here. Or excuse me, this is a contemplation of the sons of Korah. Notice the contemplation here. Verse 1, chapter 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now, there's the phrase, when shall I come and appear before God? Now, some of you in your Bibles probably have little textual notes in the margins and your little column references. And if you do, what it'll say is, for that appear before God, it makes the reference like it does in mine. It says, when shall I come and see the face of God? That's what it says. When shall I come and see the face of God? When is that? When is that time that you come to see the face of God? See, if we understand the phrases in the harvest, and we understand the timing of these three feasts in celebrating the harvest that God is bringing forth, he's saying, at these three times, all the males shall appear before and see the face of God. Now, what is the timing for that? Let's turn over to Psalm chapter 17 and verse 15. Psalm 17 and verse 15. Psalms 17 and verse 15, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Now, that same phrase appeared before me here in my translation in the New King James. It says, as for me, I will see your face. I will see your face in righteousness. When do we see his face in righteousness? I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. What was he talking about? Resurrection. One of the things that we find as we study through the scriptures, death is often likened to sleep, and resurrection is often likened to being awakened. The dead shall awake from their sleep. So he says, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Now let's look at one more place where this, verse, uh, this phrase appears, and it's in uh, Psalm 11. Psalm 11. Psalm 11, let's pick it up in verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven his eyes behold, his eyelids test the son of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. It's pretty strong, isn't it? Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind. Judgment. Fire, brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup, for the Lord is righteous he loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. Now, what's interesting about that phrase, his countenance beholds the upright, it actually means, it should be translated, the upright 
sees his face. The upright sees his face. It's the same phrase that we've been looking at. Appear before me, see his face. It's the same thing. What is the timing of seeing his face in this psalm? It's a time of judgment on the wicked, and it's a time of the upright being before him. Seeing his face. 1 John 3, 2. Let's look at that. In fact, let's pick it up in verse 1. I don't like to leave out verse 1 in 1 John 3. I'm not. I'm going right to it, Scott. <laughs> 1 John 3, 1. Because this, this whole plan of God right here, look at this. 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. We could, we could spend all day contemplating that. What manner of love has God bestowed upon you and me to call us his children. What a work he's doing. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about a time that is coming where we will no longer see through a glass darkly, but we will see face to face. Where our faith will become sight. Where we will see the glory of the Lord. His judgment is coming on the wicked to cast them into fire. His judgment is coming for the believers, the righteous, to raise them up to gaze upon his face. And it says we don't know what will be. We can't comprehend it. We can't understand it. We can hear what Paul said, that we will have a body of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 15, that as we have borne the image of dust, we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. But what does that mean? And John's saying, we don't get it, but here's what we do know that we will be like him for we will see him as he is because a man that looks at God will die in the flesh. This flesh will perish. And in the days of unleavened bread, we've been talking about we put the flesh out. We are unleavened by Christ's work in us. We have been made new. But what he's doing is raising us up to a day when we will be changed. We will be transformed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. The harvest that God is bringing forth is a harvest of people who become believers and receive the guarantee of the Spirit for a day of redemption. And these three feasts in the year that God said in the days of unleavened bread, when you begin to harvest, when you complete that first harvest in Pentecost, 50 days later, and when you celebrate it in the Feast of Tabernacles, they are picturing my times of bringing forth sons who will see face to face. He's doing something awesome, folks. He has a plan. He laid this out for us to understand. Eye has not seen or ear has heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him, but by his spirit, we see and understand things that are written in a law and in a commandment that we could look at as of the flesh and of this earth, but it's all a picture of what he's doing in the heavenly places and what he is doing in this earth, our bodies, which is flesh. Three times in the year. Turn with me now. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's keep building on this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I, I, I just want to pick it up in verse 1 here. Brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you 
which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve, and that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remains to the present, but some having fallen asleep. Okay? And now again, sleep, they had died. So it wasn't that they were sleeping and taking a nap. They were, they were taking a, a longer sleep. <laughs> Verse 7, after that he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me as one born out of due time. I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Do you believe? This is the gospel. Do you believe that he was raised from the dead? You see, our whole lives are at stake on the fact that he was raised from the dead. Notice this. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Is there a resurrection of the dead? Yes. yes. What is our proof? Christ. Christ. And we hear it on the testimony of all these witnesses. You ever think about what Paul was saying? He's like, I was persecuting this sect. I was going after the Christians. He consented to the death of Stephen, who was stoned. He said, I went about and dragged people from their homes because they believed in Christ. I went about torturing people and imprisoning people and seeing them die. This was his testimony. I was so against it, I was willing to kill over it. But then the risen Lord stopped him on the way, knocked him down, and said, why are you doing this? And totally turned his life around. You see, the witness that we have in the scriptures today is not just the witness of those who had seen him and all the works that he did in the 12. It is also one, as he says, born out of due time, the least of the apostles, but to whom the risen Lord appeared and declared himself to Paul, who was so against Christ, the belief in the resurrection. His witness speaks volumes, doesn't it? Of a people against him being turned around by the work of Christ in their lives. So continuing on. Verse 14. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. How important is his resurrection? Everything else we do here, if this didn't happen, we're just wasting our time, friends. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then everything we do is meaningless. Verse 16, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. We sang a song today about the resurrection of Christ. That he had all the sins laid on him, and he died bearing all of our iniquities. But the power over sin and death was shown in his resurrection back to life. Amen. You understand, the, 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 the crucifixion and the laying down his sacrifice, extremely important. We have no life unless he bore our iniquities. But if in bearing our iniquities, he did not overcome the power of our iniquities by being raised up from the dead, Paul's saying, our faith is futile. 
Because his coming was not just to bear the iniquity, it was to take on the iniquity and say, no more. Because iniquity brings death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. His raising up was the demonstration of God's power to say, your sin has no power to bring death in your life because of Christ. This is the gospel, the good news of our lives. That Jesus Christ bore our iniquities and that Jesus Christ overcame the power of our iniquity through the resurrection of the dead. He had the power to lay down his life and the power to take it back up. And you and me have a hope for our eternal life, not because we have any eternity in ourselves, but because Christ paid a price for us to have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish, death. We would not perish, but we would have everlasting life, eternal life. That's what Christ did for you and me. He gave himself so that you and I could have eternal life, that we could have this life. Verse 18 or let's start in 17, pick up the context again. For if Christ has not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, and so if people die believing this, that's it, you're done. Because if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, you and I have no hope of everlasting life. There is no other life. All those then who died, they're just dead. They've all perished. And if in this life only, verse 19, we have hope in Christ, we are all of all men the most pitiable. And we get a lot of pity, don't we? Because it's foolishness. The message is foolishness to those who are unbelievers, but to those who believe it is the power of God. But notice this verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead Amen. and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Why does he call him the first fruits? What was the first fruits about that we read at the beginning of this message? That when you come to bring, come into the land and you begin to harvest, you shall take a sheaf of the first fruits to present to the Lord on the day after the Sabbath. the representation of an offering. Christ risen from the dead. What did we read? When you come into the land and begin to harvest, you will take a sheaf of the first fruits to weigh for acceptance on the day after the Sabbath. And when you offer it, you shall offer it with the blood of a lamb sacrificed as a burnt offering and with a grain offering and with a wine offering they'll be presented. Just hold that in your mind. I want to show you a reality of that in a moment. So here's Christ. Verse 21, For since by man came death, by man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive but each one in his own order. There's an order to this. Did you know that? There's an order to the resurrection of the dead. When I read that as a teenager, when God began to open my mind, that blew me away. You mean God's been planning this all along? That God has a design to this? Verse 23, each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterwards, those who are Christ's at his coming. So Christ the first fruits, those who are Christ at his coming, and then the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, and he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he, speaking of God the Father, who put all things under him, that is Jesus, is accepted. That the Father determined that through Christ, 
there would be this process of resurrection, of newness of life, that there would be an order to it. Christ. Now, notice what we've been looking at here when we go back to the harvest. We talked about there's a beginning to the harvest. It begins with the cutting of that first sheaf, the first fruits, to be offered. It finishes with a count 50 days later that only began because that offering was made. Because he said twice in the scriptures, you start the count to the end of this harvest, to the day of Pentecost, with that offering being made. And then he said, and then there's this last end harvest, where we read here the end. The Bible actually uses the word end. It's the end of the year, the end of the harvest year of what God is bringing forth in harvest. Friends, this gospel message is so awesome to realize that from the very beginning, God had a plan for doing these things. So what do we see during the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Who was raised up? Who was brought forward? Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 20. John, chapter 20. John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, it says, Now on the first day of the week, and what's interesting when you look at that in the Greek language, that word week is actually the word Sabbath there. It's actually meaning the first day toward the Sabbath. First day would be today, or what we would call Sunday, beginning at sunset the night before, Saturday night, it begins an evening and a morning. That's how a day is counted uh, according to God. You can read that in Genesis chapter 1. The evening actually begins. We look at daylight as the beginning of the day, but the day actually begins right at sunset, the way God counts it. So, but on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. Again, what was early? While it was still dark. While it was still dark. And saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And she ran and came to Simon, uh, excuse me, Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. And they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Simon Peter came following and went right into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And when they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabbi, which is teacher. And Jesus said, Do not cling to me. Do not touch me, as some translations say. For I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. He was ascending on the day after the Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread. It was the very feast that God said, when you take of the harvest, take a sheaf and wave it. Wave it to the Lord for acceptance. He had been harvested. He was the first. 
But he tells Mary, don't touch me. Don't cling to me. I'm going to be waved. Paul said, Christ the first fruits, the first to be resurrected. What's interesting is she goes and tells them, and then it appears to be obvious that he went to appear to the Father on this day because then he came back and said, touch me. He says, touch me. See, when Thomas didn't believe in verse 24, notice in verse 25, so the other disciples therefore said, we have seen the Lord, and Thomas said, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the prints of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Verse 27, so Jesus, when he had appeared, said, reach your finger here, look at my hands, reach your hand here, put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And what did Jesus enter into that most holy place with? A perfect sacrifice with his own blood, he entered into the most holy place once for all, as it says in the book of Hebrews. What was the offering to be made with? In Leviticus 23, he says, when you make this wave sheaf offering, a burnt offering of a lamb, one lamb, who comes with grain and wine, like a bread and wine, his body, his blood, his appearing, and he says, it will be a sweet savor to the Lord. You realize in this moment, when Christ was risen from the dead, that work of God's sacrifice for you and me was completed because what did he do? God said, Three times in a year you shall appear before the Lord, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God. And what Jesus came with was all that he did in emptying himself of his glory, in laying down his life, in bearing our iniquities, and being resurrected back up to life. He appeared before the Lord God our Father with an offering that serves you and me to this very day. And it serves everyone, everyone who believes. See, the reality of what God was picturing in an offering to be made on the morrow after the Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread was a picture of what God was going to have in the completion and the beauty of Christ being raised from the dead for us. And he made that offering of himself. And as he makes the offering, do you know what begins? It begins a count to the completion of the first harvest to those who are Christ that is coming. Because we believe this work happened, because we put our faith in his death and resurrection, because we have faith in the bread and the wine, in his body and blood shed for us, because we have a faith in him being raised up, it begins a count. It begins a guarantee that you and I have the hope of the resurrection to life at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we will be raised from the dead. The harvest that God is bringing forth is a harvest of you who will believe, and then even at the end, there is a latter harvest spoken of in Revelation 20. There are those who are Christ that is coming. And after Christ and his saints reign on this earth, there is even another resurrection promised at the end, which I don't have time for today. But it's a beautiful, beautiful harvest. A beautiful thing. So we ask these questions in the beginning of this message. When you begin to harvest, bring forth a sheaf of the first fruits. You shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. You shall partake of none of the harvest until the same day that you have made the offering. So we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Actually, if you get your place in Colossians, I want you to just hold it there in Colossians chapter 1, and then I want you to turn with me back to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, and then we'll go to Colossians. I wanted us to go back here because I want you to notice something very interesting in the instruction about these three feasts that God makes a point of when he's giving the instruction for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Notice this in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 18. It says, The Feast of Unleavened Bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month of Abib. And remember that the, the Hebrew meaning for Abib is green ears. It's when the harvest is, is beginning. It's ready to get going. For in the month of Abib you came out of Egypt. Notice this. All that open the womb are mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep. The firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem him, then you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem and none shall appear before me empty-handed. So here in the days of unleavened bread, in this time of birth, in this time of life, God, in the giving of this commands in regard to the three times, none shall appear before me empty, he makes a point that all the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem. And now notice in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Speaking, this is speaking of Jesus. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence. So when you look again at this timing of unleavened bread, and you look at the resurrection and the beginning of the wave sheet, also see that God was saying, all your firstborn sons you shall redeem. And who was the firstborn? Jesus. That in all things he would have the preeminence in our life, that his life and resurrection, his redemption, Back to life through the resurrection begins the count to your resurrection and my resurrection. It's really awesome what God was depicting for us. Point number two, you shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. And we read in John 20, 17, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my Father. I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. He became that offering. He was raised up he had been harvested, firstborn from the dead, and now he ascends to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. Don't you, the, this is the real work of God. Everything that is a type and a shadow that we celebrate in these feasts, this is the reality. And you shall partake of none of that harvest until the same day that you have made the offering. 1 Corinthians 15 if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty, and those who have died in Christ have perished. In other words, without him making that offering, ascending, we have no hope. There is no harvest. There is no life. The life of God. God wanted us to see so plainly what he was working out his plan, his purpose, his order, that we would understand the depth of what is happening, that the great creator through whom our Father made all things seen and unseen emptied himself to be this one, that he would be slain from the foundation of the world 
and that he would have it. But we don't have to worry that the harvest isn't taking place because he's raised up. Hallelujah. The certainty of life comes because of the certainty of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How near is salvation? It's near. It's in your word. It's in your mouth. For if we confess the Lord Jesus Christ and we believe that he was raised from the dead, we shall be saved. Friends, if you have not received this message, if you have not appropriated to your personal life the sacrifice of Christ and the work that he does in resurrected life, I ask you to do it today. I ask you to say in your heart, have I given my life to him who gave his life for me? Have I acknowledged that he came for me? What manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us that we might become the children of God? Friends, if you haven't partaken of that message, if you haven't embraced it, I ask you to today. I ask you to believe in what Christ has done. And I ask you to rededicate your life. And if you've never dedicated your life, to consider if now's the time that you would take the steps to do that. Our God is worthy of praise and honor. Our God is worthy of all the glory we can give him. For he has done great and wonderful works. And this day is a day of praise. We began this service praising God that he raised up our Lord and Savior. And we're going to continue to worship our one God, praising him now. Let's worship.